Okay, Charlie, go ahead. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,762 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, our basic rules, uh, we only have two rules at the college, one of which is one fool at a time. Only one speaker at a time is recognized. And the second rule is no personal attacks. Our basic format is to have an announcement period followed by the presentation by the guest speaker. The third part will consider be, be a question period and these must be questions. And the last part of the program are the open microphone period for remarks or rebuttals. And the speaker will be given the last few comments at the end if she so chooses to do so. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming program. We got 10 of them coming up. Okay, we're continuing with our Earth Day special series of speakers. Um, on April 20th, we will be listening to the state chair, co-chair of the Illinois Green Party, Anna uh, Schriefenbein, uh, the state secretary, will be telling to us about the current agenda of the Illinois Green Party. Okay, he's bringing it up now. That's March. We're in April now. There we go. Okay. There's April 20th. Uh, on April the 27th, uh, just added to the schedule, uh, Janice Ginsler will be talking about how to kick the plastic habit, how not to use habit plastic in your daily activities. Should be a good one. I, I bought a copy of the book on this topic. There are several. Transitioning into May, we have our special May Day speaker, Joe Kopsik, college regular. We'll be talking about why the free market isn't free. And it's a rigged economy, he says, and why we should repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. I'm all for that. On May the 11th, author D. Knight, author and activist, will, will be returning. He's got a new edition of his book to be talking about, and he claims to have a realistic path to world peace, a path to peace by D. Knight. On May the 25th, two of our college regulars, Tim and Andy, will be talking about a plot to steal the presidential election this coming November. Is there a plot underfoot by the Republicans and Trump to steal the presidential election? On June the 1st, young man Tim O'Donnell will be talking about why life is not financially fair, why socioeconomic status incorporates disparities. Um, and on June the 8th, we'll be listening, we'll be listening to our actions about the Chicago Bird Coalition. There's all sorts of uh, answer to situations uh, that birds must go through in their migratory activities. So the birds will be on June the 8th. On June the 15th, longtime college regular Sid Cohen will be talking about the a short history of dialectic materialism of Marxism and how it reflects reality. So uh, a social topic on that leaves. Uh, Mike Lee is thinking of doing a thing on transportation, uh, railroad transportation, passenger trains. Uh, anyhow, if you would like to speak, 
The next open dates are June 22nd and June 29th. I must have a title and a written description in order to book a date. Okay, Tim, that's it. I have an announcement as well. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I think we have a couple of more. You want to come on up and give your announcement real quick to everybody? And we'll go from here. I'll just have you hold the mic up here when you're ready. No, please put it in the put it in the stand. All right. Well, I'm going to be using it for. Let's have people come up if they have questions, and ask them from the podium if they can. Hey, Charlie, what happened to uh, May 22nd or something like that when Kevin Camps and David Kraft were going to present? You didn't know. Oh, I. Yes, I left that out. That's no. May the 18th. May the, thank you. May the 18th will be, to, to, it'll be uh, uh, beyond nuclear and NEIS, Nuclear Energy Information Service will be talking about transporting nuclear materials. I'm sorry, thank you for reminding me. May the 18th, very important program. Okay, and my announcement is about April 25th, which is, well, this is Saturday, and a week from this coming Thursday, uh, on the, at seven o'clock, at, at seven o'clock Chicago time, uh, only on Zoom, there's going to be a program by Jacob Darwin Cameron, who wrote a, many books. One of which um, is named The Wretched Adam. And he named that book The Wretched Adam because he likes, um, oh, who's the guy who wrote The Wretched Earth? Anyway, he really liked his writing and he named his book after The Wretched Earth. And so he called his book The Wretched Adam. And uh, it's going to be a program about the history of uh, the atom, uh, the, the discovery of splitting the atom. That's the 25th of April at seven o'clock on Zoom. If you want to go to it, you have to register and you can uh, you can uh, email me on janbudar1 at gmail.com or you can just remember NEIS and email NEIS at NEIS org. Is so, it on your website? Should be on the website. Yeah. See. Except it, except that it might it's a little early because we just we just um made this a thing okay. today. So uh, it, it, if you can remember NEIS stands for Nuclear Energy Information Service and it uh, the email is NEIS at NEIS.org. Uh, you can email there if you want to come. It's seven o'clock a week from Thursday, and it'll be uh, Jacob Darwin Hamlin, who is a he's a history teacher at Oregon State University. Okay. I have an announcement, Jim. Go ahead, go ahead, Charlie. Uh, first of all, it'll make things go along a lot better if people bring their announcement up. Now, announcement should be about an event with a date and a time. Uh, and if you could come up to the podium, also with your questions, they would speed things along at the college. Thank you. But uh, my, there'll be a meeting of the Cook County Green Party. If you'd like to get involved in the Green Party itself and live in Cook County, that meeting will be on Wednesday, April the 17th at 6 p.m. at the Merlo Public Library, 644 West Belmont, Belmont Halstead, actually, around that area. That's Wednesday, April the 17th at 6 p.m. Thank you. All right, Andy, go ahead. I have just one quick uh, follow-up uh, piece of information of what Dan just said. Um, today on the, the website called The Smirking Chimp, there's an article by Harvey Wasserman. The title is called Sam Randazzo is Dead. 
and so is nuclear power. And it's a summary of the dying nuclear power industry all over the country and all over the world. Uh, that's Harvey Wasserman. It's on the Smirking Chimp. It's dated uh, April 12th, like last night. So uh, come see me if any of you have you know, want any information on these sites. It's a classic article. Thank you. Okay, turn it over to you, Tim. All right, one last. Oh. I don't think nuclear power is dead because tomorrow there'll be a general meeting and it's available on, it's going to be a live simulcast tomorrow for the Thorium Energy Alliance uh, convention down in, uh, right now it's in Texas, I believe it, I forget the city right now, but it is live stream. You can go to the thoriumenergyalliance.com website and there's been several uh, new things coming in about it. All right, Chaibu, if you're ready, uh, the floor is now yours. Take up to an hour to explain yourself, then we'll do the rebuttal, we'll do the question and answer period then we'll do the rebuttals let's give it up uh, for chai Bu. I, I, is that the correct way uh my Hello, name is chi boo chi boo i'm sorry about it. sorry about that chi boo okay she's right there i'm going to get her on screen as we go through and uh you're all set uh and just yeah. take it away Hi, everybody. Thank you, Charles, for inviting me. I am a part of the Illinois Green Party. I'm in central Illinois, uh, and so I'm technically part of the Prairie Greens. I am really excited to talk to you all because I am a candidate. Well, I'm getting signatures to become a candidate for a U.S. House representative of the Illinois District 13. And District 13 encompasses Urbana, Champaign, Savoy, Decatur, down to East, down to Sam, I'm sorry, down to Springfield, and then to, <laughs> and then to uh, Metro East in St. Louis. So that is our kind of community, and that's Illinois District 13. We are in Central Illinois, Eastern Illinois, and we're really in the heart of like the middle of everywhere, we're in the heart of Illinois, which is part of, and in agriculture land, which I really like. Again, my name is Chi Bu Asonye, and um, yes, I'm a candidate for IL-13. I'm here to talk to you all about clean, providing clean water to all of Illinois. So... Beans. All right. You can see you're just fine here, so keep going, please. Yes. Yes. Um. Okay. So, uh, this is yep. This is me. Providing clean water for all. I thought through some simple steps that would make tangible differences to the Illinois populace, not only um consistently but immediately so that way we can provide water. First, we're gonna eliminate and abolish all water debt, whether that is publicly owned or privately owned. This is also gonna be for single family homes and for renters. The second step is to uh, make all levels of government have responsibility to ha make the best choices and act in the best interests of all the, the United States citizenry. This needs to be in all at all times and at, above any other interests. The third step would be making water accessible to all 24 hours. Uh, we have part of our citizenry may be homeless or houseless. Some folks might be in transition or something might just happen where you need to be out and you need a bathroom. And so we need to make sure that our citizenry is taken care of and has the ability to clean themselves and maintain themselves with something that we all utilize. This means we're gonna create a 24 hour accessible public restrooms, fund public uh, outside water fountains. And so that way it's consistent, municipalities or cities will be given federal funds to ensure that we also have places to have public restrooms 24 hours. The fourth step to maintain um, to maintain 
cleanliness to maintain accessibility and to maintain the spaces where people will be utilizing water and keeping it clean. We would uh, directly fund clean jobs um, by creating living wages and respectable jobs of our of groundskeepers. This would be on the municipality and like city side. So this would be a part of like the park districts or city sanitation. But these are going to be people who live and work and breathe in the community, breathe in their district, and they get the honor uh, and like help our community by maintaining our spaces and uh, keeping these things clean. Last, this um, uh, this is a side story, but like this morning, this afternoon before this time, I went to, I went on a walk with my friend and I was reminded how generous and how it might seem like a, um, like a, an invisible hand of cleaning up this uh, of our spaces and keeping our um our our public lands like clean and thriving but it has to be someone who is working to do that it shouldn't be volunteers it shouldn't be on the goodness of individual or um organizations we should just have a standard of cleanliness and because that needs to be across the board in every in every uh, zip code we're going to make sure that these are livable jobs that have Keep dignity. Breaking out. This is always the same thing. I've seen this movie so many times. So um, uh, the Iranian state media. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Movie. Next. I want to point out some facts. One, um, all places, places throughout Illinois, but particularly in the city of Chicago, they use a water or sewage tax to generate revenue for the city and for the municipality. In the Chicago's instances, $775 million is allocated to the Chicago City Municipality Employee Pension Fund from water and sewage taxes. So this is one. Two, um, that 19 percent of uh the average income of water services utilized in majority black uh communities based on the low income census track from 2020 is 19 percent so these are majority black neighborhoods who are spending upward 19 percent of their annual income only on water and that's honestly unsustainable and it's we're seeing how it is in fact unsustainable the other thing I want to bring up is currently over there are um across the Illinois the across Chicago land there are 421 million dollars worth of water debt just held by the city for the Chicago um for Chicago homeowners. Chicago is a micro is a huge macrocosm of the larger Illinois community and sometimes people feel like they're um like things are kind of more well off or they make higher wages in the city. Imagine what happens in the reality of our smaller and rural and central communities. Illinois, uh, the Biden-Harris administration um, has granted Illinois upward of $300 million, billion, um, yeah, million dollars <laughs> for essential drinking water and infrastructure upgrades. That's wonderful and that's great. At the same time, often the smaller communities and central communities will not get all of that kind of money. It will go towards uh, bigger, more pressing uh, like infrastructure projects. And so in Central Illinois, in Illinois District 13, what I've really learned is a majority, if not all of our community, are people who are um, in that in-between area. So we are above the poverty line, so we may not get, we may not be seen, given the the first or all of the um, infrastructure upgrades. We will be passed on for places that are, have more immediacy, which, you know, we obviously, that's fair. But at the same time, we are not comfortable. There are sections of our community or swaths of our neighborhoods that have uh, very dirty water, have lead water, and whose and our price hikes are still affecting 
these other smaller communities. And so while Illinois is getting um, what seems like a good amount of money, when you spread that out to the uh, to the entire community, it really just pennies on the dollar. And it makes you wonder, why are we spending this amount of money, this little amount of money on water when everyone utilizes water? Thinking about the real Green New Deal through the Illinois Green Party, Green Party, <laughs> Uh, a key point of why I'm part of the Green Party and why I do believe in the Green New Deal is because we are building our tomorrow based on what we know today. We, I uh, am a, a, a proponent of like not creating new taxes to burden the working class and middle class of America, but instead redirect those ta taxes from like waste and abuse and, and things that we don't utilize to directly investing in the middle class and in the working class. When I read the Green New Deal, what really captured my interest was the fact that in the language, it has redirecting uh, research funds from fossil fuels into renewable energy and into conservation. There's no need to raise taxes to burden um, the everyday person. And the less taxes the working class pays, the more that we can use that to stimulate our economy. Uh, prof Associate Professor Manuel Theodore said, water and sewage taxes put a disproportionately heavy burden on the population that is least able to pay it. And I see that every day and we see that in the numbers. So why is this how we pay for things? Because everybody utilizes water no government, regardless of the federal level or the level, should raise tax revenue by taxing water of its use by its citizens. Yeah, and some more things about, so, so th those are, that's why that, those are the four steps that I think will tangibly make a concrete difference tomorrow into Illinois working class lives. I am someone who is meant to, is thinking through how Illinois would benefit or utilize funds and our tax dollars. And because Illinois is majority working class state, working class community, we always need to ensure that we are considering not only the middle or the upper middle class, which some people will identify in, but also people who are working class and even are working poor or living be, um, lower than the poverty wage. Water, clean water is essential to living. Um, but clean water is also one step to making sure that our needs are met. We need to make sure that uh, we have medical for all across the across the board, including dental insurance, uh, and make sure that we by getting um, by creating accessible med, um, like healthcare, we eliminate private and publicly held debt. This is where we should be utilizing our taxes for to benefit our community. A big thing for me is we have to redirect our taxes from war and waste, which is even more prevalent at the current moment, directly into the hands of the working class, middle class people of Illinois. Thank you. All is right. That, is that it then? Okay, um, I've got some questions for you. All right, Karina, okay. let me get you, uh, let me get up here so we can start directing the uh, questions and everything towards everybody. Um, okay, can everybody still hear me in the background there on the computer screen? Yes. All right. Karini, you got the first question. Go ahead. Karini, you got the first question. Go ahead. Karini, you got the first. Yes, I heard you. Thank you. Uh, you wanted to run for federal office. I need you to, to address the situation in Flint, Michigan. Is there a question in particular or just like a statement about the concept of it. All right. Do you feel that Flint, Michigan has clean water? Do you think there's a role for the federal government to play 
in resolving <laughs> the issue with Flint, Michigan? Um, are, are there other impending Flint, Michigans that could be avoided? Um, yes. Okay, cool beans. Uh, one, I have been watching uh, Flint, Michigan not have water since I was an undergrad in 2024 when it really blew up in in the in the Midwest. And so yes, it, Flint, Michigan has not had clean water for over 10 years. And that is part of why we need to eliminate water debt. We need to ensure that there is a 24 hour publicly accessible like drinking water fountains and for the United States to be a fiduciary responsible, like be morally and held responsible for the well-being of its citizenry, which at the current moment, I do not believe is what's happening, which is why I'm going to federal government to change that um, and work away all the way down. Um, Flint needs more than clean water. It also needs accountability, but it currently needs clean water now. Uh, Illinois got the $300 million. Flint, um, uh, Flint Michigan, their, the like the lawsuit got dropped um, and people were acquitted. And so like, they're not gonna get justice. We have to change that. We do need to prioritize uh, those spaces. And so, yes, we need to spend our money, not spending it overseas, not spending it on uh, on like government buyouts. We're gonna be spending it on, on Flint. Uh, East Palestine is also a good example of a Flint that's more recent. Flints that might be coming up, you know, hopefully we can not have like have less of those. But I recently was reading um, a WCIA article about uh, there's there's been a lot of sinkholes coming up in rural Illinois and in central Illinois. Uh, some do some a bit due to like coal mining. And so those are things that are going to ultimately impact the aquifers, uh, like the smaller aquifers that that feed our actual community. So a, mo a majority of Illinois isn't just like Lake Michigan, we have aquifers. Okay, there's nobody here. So Charlie, go, oh, go, 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 you wanna go up and, and ask it real quick? All right, then let's let's get up to the microphone. Okay. Yeah, we're, uh, we're gonna have our, sorry about this, Jerry, we're trying to, keep things a little more disciplined if we can. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a very political question about um, the politics of Michigan that probably relates to Flint because uh, I feel that the person who used to be the governor of Michigan, her name is Jennifer Granholm, mm -hmm. And um, she moved into becoming Secretary of Energy. And she was replaced by Gretchen Whitmer. I'm sorry, Andy, do you want to talk? Let it, let it, let's, let's keep going. Yeah, Andy, if you're going to say something, then wait until your turn to come on up to the mic, okay? If that, your name is Adam. That's Adam. Mike. Mike. Uh, 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 just, just keep going. One fool at a time. Go ahead. Um, and um, both of these women are absolutely the most spineless politicians I have ever. I mean, it's really hard to say one politician is more spineless than another. But <clears throat> these women are only um, interested in their career. They're not interested in get the job they're doing. Uh, I, let, her, let her go, she'll have a question. Go ahead, go ahead. And so uh, I wonder if you could comment on the fact that Flint had this problem. I believe you went, you were an undergraduate in 2014. You said 2024, which is now, but I think you meant 2014. And, and I'm wondering if you would comment on the kind of leadership that Michigan has experienced, in particular, the fact that Flint has had this problem for 10 years because of lead in the pipe, and the governors of the state have completely ignored it. 
Can I just want your comment? Yeah, it's frustrating to see a community that a community that looks a lot like my own suffer in the way that Flint, Michigan is continuously suffering. Uh, whether it's Chicago, like being from the city of Chicago um, in the inner city versus being in the um, Urbana-Champaign and East St. Louis area, we're very similar to Flint. We're a uh, particular demographic and we have uh, like industry there and there are lead pipes in some of the buildings and some of the homes that are in my community as well. And it's just, it's disheartening because it's happening under democratic leadership. It's disheartening because a lot of the middle, uh, a lot of a good amount of the Midwest is held under democratic leadership. And so it's Democrats who are leaving fellow Democrats high and dry, or it's, it's um it's Democrats leaving the working class, the middle class, the, the most vulnerable people to the sharks at that point. Or they're kind of seen as cloud old damage and they don't like it even takes time to be able to protest. It took time to be able to get uh like to to resource and fundraise to get clean water for yourself. I know for 100 percent that you're right. I meant um I was in 2020. 2014, I was an undergrad, I was first year student, and we were already trying to bring in, uh, trying to sell things, create things to send money to, so that way, like our counterparts had water there. And they still don't have clean water. That's the key. They still don't have clean water. So my comment is, Honestly, day day one of a Green Party administration or something different, uh, or um, or me being within uh, me being within Congress, I would declare if we uh, I would declare and have us like actually put in all the money, all the effort to get new pipes, to get um the medical debt down, so that way their uh the like the property taxes aren't infected or the property like rates aren't infected like that. It is so important for us to think about how the everyday, like citizenry, deal with problems. Um, not only, and the other thing is like health healthcare. You know, so if you don't have clean water, what happens? You 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 can get sick. Uh, how do you take care of yourself afterwards? So Flint, Michigan, would need to be made an entire an entire um medical emergency. A national emergency so that way the entire community has the resources um to take care of themselves because the government failed them okay we got two more mike lee and then we're gonna go i got a two-part question we'll get to you charlie don't worry i see your hand okay go ahead mike so um i'm pretty sure that flint gets water out of here on lake here on which is pretty pristine they're connected they, to the detroit water system now you guys are listening to the news from 10 years ago they, i don't think they're getting plastic bottles plastic bottled water no, they're getting it from they're getting it from the uh, detroit michigan now their, their water system is connected which is connected to lake huron yes yeah and that's very pristine okay i um i don't know why people are against the this may, this uh, governor of Michigan is going to be our next president. Time to start getting behind her. She's got she's got guts. Gretchen, hell yeah, man! She stood down. Jack Hood. Hey, Jack, Mike, what's your question? Jack booted uh, uh, right wingers, man, with guns. Okay, so what's your question? Guts. What's your question? Okay, Mike? so check, please check that if you can. I think that they're getting their water back from the Huron and Flint. Um. <laughs> you know, it makes perfect sense, but I think that's the case. And um, second of all, you know, Chicago has pretty clean water, and this whole lead pipe stuff is a scam by big plastic and big water companies. Okay, you know, I've been drinking Chicago tap water for about 90 years now. I feel like I'm 90 years old. But um, it's perfectly fine. This is a big scam by contractors that put in pipes and big plastic bottles. 
So please check into that. Plastic bottle water is so unhealthy. Okay, Mike. And it's so uh, bad for the environment. That's your question, Mike. So can you please check into those two issues? Get your story on Flint, please. And then can you also check into the scam of the lead in the pipes? Okay, Hi. Those two Let things. it rebut. Yes, I can. I have a research. I have a research team that uh, that talks through. Yeah, I have a research team that thinks through uh, current events, tries to find the newest thing. So maybe it's not ten years ago. What's happening now? And um, they're watching this, or and will be later. So they will get on seeing the newest things. The ultimate goal is to make sure that the people in Flint and the people in East Palestine, the people who are impacted and need to be able to drink and bathe in water, knowing that they will not get sick as their end result. Um, that's what we want. I am from the, I'm from Chicago. I grew up <laughs> drinking uh, Lake Michigan water, tap water, because yep, I'm not gonna pay fine. more money for water. I don't love, um, and I, I actively don't use like plastic. And so, yes, I totally get that. Ultimately, there is tangible need to to and to reinvest and change the infrastructure that might be in Flint. And if they're getting new water, that's wonderful, as long as they're able to drink it and continue to maintain um, their like livelihood. That's what's important. So yeah. Yeah, I think they're getting here on Lake Huron water as well, like they should have. They they they, they are. Uh, of course. There was a question in the chat, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, the question was from Anna, what's the source? I'm assuming it's about the Lake Huron question. Uh, and so I just wanted to throw that back out there. Well, the right now the source for Flint, Michigan water is actually Detroit's water system. The problem started out when they started getting it from one of the rivers that degraded yes. their, their pipes. And now they switched back to Detroit. But the problem is now they have all that lead pipe in there that they need to replace in their system in Flint. It's the water quality going in and that's not the problem. It's the infrastructure in Flint right now that's the problem with the pipes. And that takes a while it to was replace. For, it was for the source on the lead in Chicago. Oh, okay. The source on the lead in Chicago is the same thing. They've required lead for years years it's again it's not this water coming out of the water filtration plants it's the lead contamination that comes from yes. uh mike i don't think you know what yes, you're talking about <laughs> all right anyway we're, we're enough said all right uh your questions next and then we'll go to charlie my name Thank is you. daniel weinberg um hi what nationality are you i'm american are you american Hi, yes, I am Nigerian American. I'm Nigerian American. I'm the proud daughter of two lovely immigrant Nigerian immigrants. Um, yeah, and I was, yep. My my boss is uh, is from Nigeria, immigrant from Nigeria. She's very very smart. And she tells me, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, water farmers. There are a lot of farmers in your area. Yes. All right. Yes. Anyways, uh, Illinois is a lot of farm. Now, farm practices affect water, water, uh, the water cycle. Mm -hmm. and if people, if farmers use a lot of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, it kind of dries out the water system. And the water doesn't, it doesn't rain as much, it doesn't, uh, water just evaporates. So do you have any plans to talk to the agricultural community around your area in the 13th district? Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes I do. I am seeing the direct result, I, I'm seeing drought in my community. Um, I always assumed that drought is something that happened in California uh, and maybe like 
Texas or like Nevada or something. But now Illinois is in a drought and it has been for the last, I think the, someone was like the last seven years, um, but it was our local police uh, fire chief who shared this past summer that all of July, a majority of August and all of June, we had been in uh, a diversion of Illinois drought. That boggled my mind. When I think about how do we retain water uh, because our agricultural land is actually so fertile, it's so nice. It's 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 like some of the best uh, land in an entire world. That's not something that we say here, but because it's true, we need to make sure that we are keeping the ground as healthy and as strong and as thriving as possible. This means utilizing all forms of knowledge, all forms of understanding of how to maintain uh, the ground that we live in. This includes indigenous uh, like farming practices, um, uh, 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 maybe uh, like uh, revitalization practices. I think that we're gonna have like, we're gonna have to come together as a as a as a, a community, our farmers included, and a lot of a majority of the Illinois farms are, Charlie. excuse me, owned our family farm, our family farmed or oh. family owned farmed, family owned farms, <laughs> and so coming together and saying, you know, we need to like the priority is to make sure that everyone has water to use. We all know that we're gonna need food and we're gonna need sustenance from the ground that's here. Okay, that's not gonna randomly change. Now that we have those two things in mind, how do we work together as a community rather than working um, against each other? Maybe we use less pesticides in one way and we um, and we change to use some, uh, well, we're, we're a prairie, so, but we don't have a, a lot of prairie farm as much. So how do we utilize old and new technology so that we can keep this land as fertile and as, as, as wonderful as it can be? The other thing is, Thinking in the future, thinking of one drought, we're going to have more. Thinking of um, severe weather, we're going to have more severe weather. We're going to have to also consider and prioritize being um, resilient for the future. So that way my generation and the future generations behind me, like my kids and, um, and goes behind me, are able to also have this amazingly prime, pristine a uh, wonderful agriculture that will continue to, that has always can sustain the people who live in our community. Okay. Uh, all right, Charlie, you got the next question. Go ahead. Yes, Madam Candidate. The, there are commercial for-profit operations that use on a daily basis 100, at least 100 times more water than I do. Yes. Part question: Do you plan to mm -hmm. uh, regulate them in any fashion uh, as to their uh, the amount that they're using, uh, such as farming and this, uh, factories, farms, and factories? Do you plan to regulate the amount of water that they use, or two? Do you plan to tax them to help pay for the system that they're taking advantage of and yep. at taxpayers expense thank you good question the first is yes we'll need to regulate them everybody uses water everyone needs water we're going to need water tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that we needed it yesterday is too the thing that i'm seeing is these companies are not pay like they are paying pittance less than a cent, less than a fraction of a cent on the amount of water that they're using. And yet you and I will be taxed out the Wahoo to pay for this water that we're using. So really we, the the um, the Illinois taxpayer, the Illinoisans here are subsidizing their free use, their, their exorbitant use of water that has to stop. Because the Illinois government, because the federal government is now a like, held to responsibility, held to account, and have to act in the best interest of the Illinois people and the Illinois citizenry, we can't allow for the the continued free reign of use of water that these companies have. And yeah, that's going to be a, a fight that we're going to have to face. Excuse me. But ultimately, water isn't free. Like it needs to be accessible. It needs to be open to all, but it's not free in the terms of if we allow people to not 
Like it's not free in terms of it has it, it has a value. And it has a as a, a as an intrinsically huge value that's more than money has because we all have to have water. We all utilize water. We need to clean ourselves, brush our teeth, and if we don't have water, we won't be able to survive. And so that's the first thing. Yes, we're gonna have to regulate it. Um, I would say that we're gonna incentivize the disuse. One, um, the subject of disuse. What I'm realizing is because there's not a cost paid to the these mega corporations who are raking in billions and dollars of profit on their own, and then able to like spend money wherever that they want to, and not reinvest it in the community. Um, it shouldn't be the tax burden should not be on the on the Illinois taxpayer. It needs to be on those corporations. One hundred percent. The other thing is at the current moment in this two year period that I'm hoping to be in Congress, I do not want to change or modify taxes. I would like us to look at how we spend our money with what we currently have and say we used to spend it on this. Here's what we did. Uh, last year with the same amount of income, the same amount of revenue, the same amount of everything, we instead did this and look how amazing it was. Look how great it was. I want to prove to the powers that be who don't care about the Illinois taxpayer, who don't care about anyone here in this room, who don't care about my generation and the generation before me, the generation that's going to come after me. They don't care about any of those things. I want to prove that I'm, I'm just as smart as you all. We're all capable of this, and it's truly not that hard. That's why I only had four steps, four steps to providing clean water, because those four big pillars, those that that reorientation from corporations and personal benefit from um from governmental people into the people who actually live and breathe and work on the soil. When you make that pivot, that's where your profit lies on. It can't be how much revenue you can gain. It has to be how many people this year, uh, you know, had clean water or how, like we met that standard, the EPA standard that we currently have. We don't need to change anything. We're going to use the money that we have here and say, okay, maybe, yeah, you all get taxed instead, blah, 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 blah. But I want to, I want to say we don't raise taxes. We don't change taxes for two years. And then we can say, yes, here's how we want to change the taxes. Thank you. Very good. Okay, you want to go ahead next? So I have to modify my questions a little bit. Um, but the devil's in the details. Uh, you told us about you know where a lot of the tax money from the water is going. Uh, you rightfully have pointed out that, that those taxes can disproportionately fall on people who are least able to pay. Um, I think someone mentioned that one of the problems that was underlying Flint, Michigan, was the fact that they were having trouble affording paying for their water. And now you're saying you don't want to raise any taxes. You want to redistribute the money that is already being collected. Is there enough money there to do it? And if not, where are you going to get it? We 100% already have the money. It's going to the military. We gave it in in cash gifts to other countries this past year and a half, three years. We have the money. The money's already there. I don't need to raise taxes because we waste, we put, we give gifts to other places. We can give gifts to ourselves. That's okay. You know, you wonder why we're spending money on defense. I'd like to find out what your support is about the uh, situation in Israel and the Gaza war. If you can. I can and I will. I have personal feelings about the war on Gaza and what I see is a genocide being perpetrated by Israel in Gaza to the Palestinians and diaspora across the, um, across the country. Illinois has a huge Palestinian population and they are horribly suffering at this current moment, period. Thinking logistically, the United States has an obligation under international law to abide by the Geneva Convention, to divide by our current standards of, of like warfare, and we are currently not doing that. Why? How? For what? 
<laughs> that's the baseline. That's the minimum. What we what needs to happen that my gut my stance is we have to follow the actual laws, the rule based orders. We are not above it. We have to uh, ensure that all our weapons are not being used to facilitate harm and that we're not going against the ICJ. Um, so that's that's my point. I think that what's happening is absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely a genocide. And as a governmental employee, we have to be following the treaties that we sign because we are a sovereign country. What do you do if your enemy does not follow that like Hamas is doing with their uh, positioning their headquarters and hospitals and using human shields? Mm -hmm. Using civilians for human shields. Supposedly. No. Okay. In this conversation, are we going to be able to talk about Zionism and the difference between okay. Zionism and anti Semitism? Right? We can separate those two? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, cool beans, cool beans. I like to start that off because it's very important to say like, Hamas is 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 embedded in infrastructure. Hamas is a government <laughs> that runs Gaza because that was the government that was established or voted in 17 years ago, and that's like that's all that's it. it it's a uh, we can call whatever, but that's it's a government that does things, and governments do for the people that's there. So the, so that's what's very important. It's also important for us to remember that there is also international laws to mm -hmm. warfare. So regardless of if Hamas people are go are embedded in place uh, in human places and in, in hospitals, they're still protected. In homes where civilians are, they're still protected. I think it is absolutely like it, it is absolutely our role to always keep ourselves and our allies to the highest of standards because we are having to show that we are the people who, who we want to continue to be in charge. We're the good guys. We're the whatever. So we have to hold ourselves to the highest standard and our allies regardless of what other people are doing, particularly since we've learned from our own mistakes in war, right? We've learned from bad things. We don't want to continue to do those things. So if we're a great military intelligence, we have to make sure that we're following by those rules. So the practical reality is you're gonna have to you're gonna have to to keep in mind that the casualties will actually need to be lowered. I want lower casualties, but in war you're gonna have to lower casualties. So now you need to be more strategic. How do you how do you like no like how do we say the casualties are too high? We have to lower things with this thing. It's also, and the key why I brought up um, anti-Semitism anti is different from like, or Semitism is, is different from Zionism and making sure those who are separate is because we need to think about why, why are we moving the way that we're moving? How are we moving the way that we're moving? I don't know if you've Follow, if you've been following the like, um, and you know, we brought up Hamas. So the 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 casualty, the the rate of casualties that are happening amongst the Palestinians, and regretfully, of course, the Israelis that were harmed in October seventh is absolutely horrible. And any and all of the soldiers are currently being harmed, which they are in Gaza, coming out of the field. A lot of them are having PTSD. Those Israeli soldiers, the other folks, um, are coming back with wounds. There's like a fungus coming on. Anyway, if you're following those things, you may have also heard about Lavender AI or the AI group Lavender and the AI thing, where's my daddy? Those programs, if they are in fact being implemented, which seems to be from our from the government on Shania that they are, it could say that we are we are allowing for higher civilian casualties when we shouldn't be or when we don't want to be, when our international rules say that we we cannot actually and so i would say that to answer your question if and if and with the understanding that hamas is holding human shields because i don't like that rhetoric but, but considering that and are and embedded in civilian human infrastructure we still the united states and our yeah. allies need to hold ourselves to the say to the rules of international warfare because that is why we have rules in international warfare. We're a country, we're a sovereign country, and we need to act as such. All right, I'd like to ask one more question. Are you familiar with the conflict in Sudan right now? 
Ooh. Yes, I am. That's even bigger. Why aren't we hearing such an outcry? I would say if I'm being honest and as wholesome as possible or as like not crude as possible, it's because it's, the Af I think because the genocide that's occurred in Sudan is in a, a poor African country. Um, and Sudan is obviously a country within the larger continent of Africa. Uh, and they have resources that our country and our country people, citizenry, use. Right? Um, there, it, yeah. So I would say that there is a, there is a capitalist benefit for the populace knowing about the genocide happening in Sudan and the complex happening in Sudan and the war that's happening in Sudan there than uh, like us knowing we sh we need to know less about that because that there's a benefit for the individual populace of our community. So that's what I would say. Okay, I know I was kind of hard on you with questions, but uh, thank you for answering them. I think you did a decent job for what you know about it. And uh, I'm going to proceed. Charlie, I know you're online. You're going to have another question. Yeah. Oh, you're next. Charlie's already back. So, so yeah. well, I've already been all of a sudden. Go ahead. Go ahead. I will get Charlie after you. So I, I totally agree with you that we uh, we have you know responsibilities at an international level. Um, but I guess the question I have is if we are going to hold our ally, Israel, to certain standards on their behavior in the face of what happened. Had you been given decision power, or if you'd had authority, what would you have done between October 7th and October 28th to make it unnecessary for Israel to go into Palestine or into Gaza? Because you're you're saying, well, we should we should hold them, but you either got to let them go or you have to give them a reason why they don't need to. So how do you get them back? And I will point out that the UN Security Council was silent during that three-week period. They didn't say anything until well after the invasion. So considering that Israel has a huge paranoia that everyone's out to get them, justified or not, that's how they feel. And Hamas has stated publicly that their goal is to eliminate Israel. No, it's they've said it. Yeah, you know, they I, say it, and their actions, and their actions, and their actions they have yes, but that's their propaganda. It's just, their propaganda it's says propaganda. they're trying to get, they want to eliminate Israel, and they have now demonstrated with their actions that that so seems to be what they're the doing. Economy. So, you know, what what do you do to to, to <laughs> undo October seventh before the war starts? We cannot undo October 7th because we cannot um, undo October 6th. We cannot undo um, October 5th. We cannot we cannot uh, undo that March of Return that happened in like, was it 2018 or 2014? It was when Obama was in office is my understanding. I don't know exact dates, but all those things are things that we cannot undo. We can't undo the creation of Israel, we can't undo the Nakba of 1948. Those are all historical contexts that we can't undo and that we have to understand given the circumstances and now to give us um context for how and why and to what extent like October 7th is in the larger story. So the question you asked was, what would I have done October like 8th to 28th or October 7th and on? Well, the first thing I would have done is encouraged my allies to show restraint because what we've seen is a decrease well i would i would say show restraint on the front end because we saw a very high death toll of not only gazans and palestinian gazans and international or just and anybody in that kind of space but we also saw um the death of israeli jews i believe is the, would be the term um, in those kibbutzes that were fired upon, not by Hamas, but by um, the IDF, the, the Israeli Defense Force, also sometimes called the Israel Occupation Forces, um, but in this case, we'll call them the IDF. And so that's something that's key. 
what I kept hearing is, uh, this is Israel's um, uh, uh, September 11th. This is Israel's September 11th. And I'm like, okay, well, I was alive <laughs> during a October 11th. I remember where I was. Um, I have I had cognizance, and I still remembered the fear and that bloodlust. My understanding is that we learned from our mistakes, so we do have to share that information with our counterparts because that's you want to act differently in war. So I would have asked for a strength. I also have, I've been calling for my uh, my congressperson right now, is so we need these hostages back. The the most times that we got the um, the the majority of um, hostages was actually during that ceasefire period, was it not? And so in my mind, I wanna focus on getting the people who could potentially become collateral damage, but there are people who are sitting through who are the most important. We need to get them out. We need to get them cared for. Get them the 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 services that they need. Um, and so I would have cautioned and told my my um, excuse me, my counterparts in Israel that your priority has to be getting back the hostages. Nothing else is as important as that. We like we have to maintain. This is what has to happen because we've seen in our past. Uh, fights in our past conflicts that that when we want our hostages back, we get them through ceasefires, we get them through negotiations. And right now we're not seeing our hostages get back. If the if the amount of money tracks, there could be Illinoisans who are actually in Gaza amongst the hostages. There were Illinois people already there who had um who had connections to the Chicago suburbs and the East St. Louis area. And those are two separate families. So there is a there's a very legitimate likelihood that there are Illinoisans who are amongst the hostages in Gaza and they're being bombarded. They're being given no water. They don't have clean uh clean clothes. They they won't have sanitary pads. These are women who might have not might not have sanitary pads. And this is all happening because there is a siege on Gaza placed by the country of Israel. A country of Israel that's our allies. Okay, yeah. Uh, we have to hold, so we will have to hold them to account. We will have to hold them to the same standard that we hold ourselves to. That's what I would do. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right, uh, Madam Candidate, uh, your district, the 13th, is situated in the Great Lakes Basin yep. when in terms of water, the Great Lakes Basin. Have you given any thought or cons would you consider voting for a one water policy to cover the dozen or so states and all the communities that comprise the Great Lakes Basin regarding water policy? Would you consider that? When you say, could you clarify, when you say a one water policy, like a one, like a one size fits all kind of thing, or is that like a particular term that you're referencing? Well, that there's a basic standards for its use and, and disposal and wastewater and so forth. Okay. Well, yes, we're going to have to have a standard because what we don't want is for some communities to be left out or to be given the lower end of the stick uh, or like the, the, the worst end of the pie. And then the same communities are always given preferences or, or typically given the higher affluent communities. Um they will continue to be given the same cut of the slice of pie as always. We do not want to disproportionately impact a lower income communities regardless. So I would say we will have, we have EPA standards. And so that will continue to be uh, like a fair standard of living, whether we end up changing those um, to make them like higher quality or anything like that, or um, make it so that there's less pollution in them. Like that's perfectly fine. And then after we have the baseline kind of finished and covered, we'll want to do remediation. So where are the dirtiest places? Where are the cleanest? Well, if we know they're clean spaces, great. What is making them so clean? Are there things that we can bring to other spaces? Um, and then from there, work with individual communities because the, the remediation, the recovery could be different. Um, so maybe you're in a place that used to be very swampy, but then they they took out the swamp water to make like Illinois, right? So maybe we actually have to um, plant different, like we have to do different irrigation, plant different 
prairie things so that way or create different greens so that way that the water it, it can be to the healthiest for the community there and beyond healthy good water and healthy community healthy water one place will always create better water for everyone in other places madam secretary <laughs> hi how would you like to be addressed um well, <laughs> I always think that sounds cool, Madam Secretary. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going for Congress, so so you can just call me, call me you can call me Miss Chibu, that. or yeah, Congresswoman is fine. Congresswoman, elect. Hi. Who, who are you running against, Nikki? Yes, Nikki Bazinski. She is a Democrat. Uh, and then is there another person running too? There is a Republican candidate. Um, that'll be running for office too. His name is Lloyd. Well, I don't want to lie actually, but I, I, I don't, I'm not gonna, there's two people and I, um, and I forget who exactly won, but there is going to be a Republican and a democratic option. Yep. And this is November? Yes. November 5th, y'all. Well, we didn't get to vote for the 13th there. I got the Quigley and you know? all he does is play. Hockey. Is he um a Democrat or Republican? And promote wars. Huh? A Democrat or Republican? Okay. Well, here's what I would say. Hey, you know, I, he, but you know, everybody here is. You know what? I think plastics. You're onto something, but I think plastic bottled water is a huge problem. Not only pollution, but when you drink plastic bottled water. Uh, you're drinking uh, chemicals and plastics are, you know, we're all eating plastic, microplastics. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I think you're on the, the right track there and, uh, we got to fight the big oil. We got to fight big plastics and those are the biggest two pollutants in this country, in the world. And, um, I mean, plastics are a nice product, but we got to look at other ways. You know, the country are looking at other ways to package things. So I try to stay away from having plastics as much as I can. Yeah. Or reuse, reduce, re reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. recycle, all that stuff for your, uh, you know, to keep that stuff out of the water and environment. There's so land pollution, water pollution, air pollution, and all that. All right. Um, so uh, my qu last question to you is, uh, let me think of a good one. Can I get a drum roll? And um, so now the Green Party's been getting a bad reputation the last couple, the last decade or so because they become the spoiler for the two major parties. And um, a lot of times, uh, a strong Green Party candidate will swing an election. Um, so they have power, unintended power, but maybe they have power. But um, it would be nice to see some uh, progress in, in the way they uh, go about things. And uh, But yeah, I mean, that, that's all I got to say about that, I guess. But yeah, fight big oil and fight big plastics. All right. Is there uh, who else has anything else? Any other questions? Come on. Can I have a rebuttal to his statement? Or go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so my my like response, it wasn't particularly a question, but that's fine because uh, I like talking, and so I got what you hear. Oh, I got what you say. Yes, big oil. Yes, big um plastic. When we think about how we got these materials and why we use them in everyday life, a lot of it's just been given to us because of surplus or given to us because it like it was a way to make money for other people, but we don't particularly use them and we don't particularly want them. When the Illinois government, when the state, when the federal government is beholden to the people and no longer corporations and no longer big businesses and big, these huge lobbyist groups, the yeah. money is going to be, be able to be used differently. And so I think that um, I don't believe in the spoiler effect. I think that that's what I've seen, how that is a means to keep people who are interested in change complacent and willing to um, to work with incremental change because they're not seeing the fact that they could easily change why 
there's no like it's easy to change why there is no spoiler effect or there's it isn't to change the spoiler effect if there was one and so in my opinion if like illinois is a, is a very big democratic space stronghold and it's a democratic party that gerrymanders our space it's the democratic party that ends up um, keeping these uh, these these wild rules where I have to get twelve thousand signatures over twelve thousand signatures to get on the ballot, and that means and they're going to be challenged because the Democrats challenge everybody so that way no one gets on the ballot. Like that's the point, and so I don't believe in spoiler effect. That's that that is created. Like the 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 the, the, the spoilers aren't the the third parties. The spoilers are the Democrats. It's not just the Green Party, it's other third party uh, candidates. Correct. Well, the Libertarian Party, the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Like, yeah, it's all meant to keep us out. Hey, I got one last question. Where do you get your drinking water from? In Champagne? You're in Champagne, right? Yes. Champagne, Champagne, yeah, it's the Mohammed from Aquifer. From an aquifer? Yeah, down yeah. under a well. Yep, yeah, the Mohammed Aquifer. Hey, Charlie, go ahead. That we'll get our yes, Madam Candidate. I see that you are a founder of a, a cohort, they call it, Seniors, Young People of Illinois. I'm not a young person. I'm an old person. Do you, do you plan to, you got any idea how to take care of the senior citizens of this country, of Illinois, who created this good state? Do you think we're giving a fair treatment or we have our needs are being met? Your needs are not being met. I know you're not, your needs are not being met because a lot of the people who I live and work around are about your age or, <laughs> or younger and they are unhappy and they are seeing how their healthcare. So they, um, I have a good amount of people right now who are obviously working, but they're looking towards retirement. And part of why, the, so I have someone who's 62 and they're going to uh, retire in three years. And they're like, the only thing that is annoying is now the way that the retirement works, they will be given a worse healthcare plan that's going to be more expensive based on their limited income. So they're going to be now on a limited income because they're retired. They've worked their whole lives for however many careers that they have sometimes, I probably have a second job because most of the people who I work with do have second jobs. And now this is my side hustle. Um, and so I think that you are not being taken care of right now by the system that's currently in play. The way that I would take care of you is again, by looking at the taxes that we currently have and the way that we fund these pensions, the promise that was given to you all needs to be held, but it needs to not be held in um, in like in competition with the youth, because then we're going to only build resentment. Right. Right now, I think that there is a, a class of citizens who are not retiring yet. And uh, but their kids are like are younger than me. So they're like, oh, yeah. They won't get retirement. That's fine. We're going to just take care of the seniors, but they're not taking care of you. They're making things more expensive, making it worse and worse and worse and putting seniors onto these like bad plants is my understanding. And they're so complicated. Why is it? Why? Why? Why is it so many like all this jargon and all of these um, like in, in, intermediaries that just keeps taking like cents on upon cents of fractions of what could be your pension away uh, for these middle managers that don't do anything and are just there because people wanted to make money off of us. When we orient the government and orient our pensions to the people, you all will benefit too. And because we'll no longer be pushing against each other as resentment for this weird group of people who are screwing over both of us, <laughs> we're going to make that generate, like we're going to make the people who uh, who gambled away your pensions who are lowering your social security, who are privatizing everyone, we're gonna make them pay for it. They have the funds, they have the things, they have the, they took the profit. Great, you promised to pay for this and now you're going to, we're gonna hold them to account. And that's how I take care of the, of the older generation because once we get, once you all feel like we're no longer trying, like once you all get covered and we can see the, the, the direct change, 
that will only continue to benefit the younger, the next, next, next generation. If we set up the upcoming generation, like my generation for success, we will see what's working and make sure that your generation gets the benefit. Like, I promise you, we take care of our elders. We heard you, we do it, we got you. Even like nursing homes, and this is a side point, but like rental communities, um, mobile homes and like those, like, um, like, I don't know if they're called trailer parks anymore, but the new version of a trailer community park thing, um, those are also like a lot of our people who are, have a set income will live there and they might even own the home, but they don't own the land that's on the home. So they can be priced out of a home that they've lived in however long since they ended retirement. Those are things that we need to ensure are not happening for our, our, our for the old generation because that will trickle down to the rest of us. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question. Hi. Uh, Steve Bone, Madam Congresswoman. I was talking about social security. The health benefits. It used to be zero, I think, in 1935. I wasn't there. I heard it was zero, and now it's up to like 100. Something that Congress people vote on the amount that Medicare will cost every month for Part B or Part D, whatever it is. Part B, maybe. Um, will you be voting for a higher amount for Medicare health care? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, wait one second. When you say higher amount, um... Are you referring to like the cost that medic that like the out of pocket cost that people are going to be paying, or is this where like Medicare is able to um, negotiate the 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 drug prices kind of thing? No, 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 no. Okay. Every every I think every person on medic Medicare, sixty million or fifty million people, get a. Uh, cost every month if they have Part B for medical, maybe Part A for doctors. I don't know. One is the doctors and one is medical. But there's a monthly cost that keeps going up every year. And the government has to approve that. And so will you, you support that? I would say would, I would not support the increased cost of anything that is going to be placed on the uh on the citizenry or the people so yeah. if if that's what the, if that's if that's what happens if my now out of pocket cost is double or a third more i do not agree with that no i would not raise that price okay okay um uh your social security program. we're going to take about another 5 minutes of questions go ahead on uh the water system, like in Chicago, Chicago controls the water distribution, not just for Chicago, but goes pretty much out into the uh, into the suburbs, like out to Farrington and Naperville. Because what happened in Flint, they were feeling that Detroit was charging up too much for water, so they switched to this river water, and they were not giving it the amount of treatment they were supposed to, which caused the lead to come out into the piping. So sometimes these uh, big cities that can control the water, they start shafting other communities to, to get more money for their their own city. All right, um, Charlie, I'm gonna make you a temporary host. I gotta renew my debt, Charlie. Charlie, can you? I, I'm going to make you temporary host. I got to renew my uh, web connection here, so I'm going to be dropping out for a brief minute or two. Um, Jaibu, I'm going to have to. Uh, we got like a limit on the connection I'm using right now. I just got to renew it real quick. So yep. uh, we're going to be transferring the host to Charlie real quick.
All right, uh, Shibu, Madam Candidate, would yes. you like to respond that the cities are cheating surrounding suburban communities and in providing them with water? Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? I won't say if it's that, that that's not accurate because the idea of the perception of cheating is going to be based on the beholder. Um, in theory, the city of Chicago could be doing what's best interest of the city of Chicago officials, probably not the city of Chicago citizenry. Um, and that is having an adverse effect on the neighboring suburbs. That could very much be true. And I will say probably like, sure. I, I can see that. With that being said, we do not want to be in competition with our fellow country people, like our our fellow countrymen, our, our fellow country folks, other Illinoisans. Like we're all Illinois and we all have to, again, leave water and have healthy water for everybody. And so we would look at how, uh, what are, like, what are the, who's getting what water and how tainted or untainted that water is. Uh, we can work as a group to ensure that not only that the city's not competing, that all the everyone's getting um a, a great a better minimum and a good a good minimum. And uh we make that smaller, like the middle, less and less and less. So there's obviously more consistency throughout the the state. Okay, yeah, I don't you. I don't I definitely think something that I saw about the cheat, this is a side thing, um, but the teachers unions and the pension between like Chicago and um, the South, like Southern um, Illinois, that was a really big thing when I was in school. And um, I heard how like, well, some of us are paying into one thing, which means you all don't pay into that. And really Chicago's dealing with this, even though the other suburb or other part of Illinois is not. We're we're one entity, and yes, we have different systems, we have different municipalities, and we want to be as sent as localized as possible. Agreed. At the same time, we can all work together to be a more cohesive, uh, like like ecosystem, rather than something that is basically a parasite within itself. There was an organization that came to the college. And municipal water is either provided by the city employees or by a company or companies that contract to do this. Mm -hmm. Which version would you prefer? I like publicly owned things and publicly owned options because it will, I see it reduce waste, fraud, and abuse rather than uh, and uh, and allows for better accountability and ensures that we're consistently reinvesting in to the the infrastructure rather than to uh like not stakeholders but shareholders um so that's what i would say i'd say i'm i'm public public cooperative all the way i've seen them work better and i want to always reduce the the tax burden and the 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 like the cost burden on the individuals of our society Okay. Um, there's a term applied to water. They call it the public commons. Do yes. you think that's an accurate term? Yeah. It's a thing that is open to all and corporations are given as are, are made a part of that all. And as a result, uh, individuals are not are being actively held not accountable to how they're utilizing the water. And so in that term, I'd say, yeah, it is a, it's like, it's a, com it's like a public common that has to, that the value of water will have to change. Water, water is valuable. It is a valuable, that's why everyone needs it. That's why everyone wants it. That's why everyone uses it. It's a valuable resource that we have to treat as such and revere as such. If there was a company in the district that would have to shut down because it was misusing water. Would you go along with that? Well, yeah. If you're misusing water and you're a company, you're impacting the larger community. So yes, the community can like 
the community can decide to take ownership of that space, of um, changing hands. I would say that typically when a company is misusing or creating fraud and abuse, it's a small group of people who are making a lot of group of people uh, make bad decisions and bad choices. But when we keep in mind who's actually utilizing the space, so the people who are actually working, the laborers, then, and they're based in control, there's a better, there's less <laughs> waste, fraud, and abuse, I'd say. All right, Anna's got a question, Anna. Yeah, I just wanted to to thank uh, Chaibo for running uh, for office and helping protect our water. Um, it, it is extremely um, necessary for us. Um, and uh, even if it what even even if we didn't see these signs, even if we didn't listen to, to some of the scientists, it's still something that we need and that we always need to protect. And I like that with the Green Party, it's everybody's personal responsibility to make sure we have this. Our children and our children's children, we will all need this. Um, if And we need to make sure we take every effort to uh, go ahead and protect those, protect the water rights. Um, and so running for office is one of those ways that we can get good government in and that we can get healthcare divest from war um so i just wanted to thank her for running and i hope that um i will see everybody next week okay we're up thanks anna uh, the, the, the anna's there okay all right well, anyway um, <laughs> all right i'm sorry about missing some of that stuff on youtube we had a little bit of a connection problem but we were back live now uh, if there's no more questions, I'd like to go to rebuttals. I'd like to go to rebuttals now, and uh, I'm going to give everybody about four minutes to rebut. Um, so uh, whoever wants to go first here at the restaurant gets started. Um, so, uh, Andy, you want to rebut first or not? Uh, who, uh, all right, Mike Lee, come on up. We'll start rebutting and then we'll alternate. When I get somebody online, we'll go from there too. All right, Mike, you got four minutes. Trump fans, Trump fans. <laughs> I don't think that's a Trump fans. No. Mike, get up there and rebut. Okay. Thank you, Adam Speaker. Uh, yeah, pollution is an issue all over the world. And uh, water, land, air, light, people, <laughs> it's all nasty and dirty. So we just gotta, we just gotta uh, go after all the polluters, all the uh, problem makers. And um, I really think the core of all evil is big oil and big plastics. So um, get the plastics out of our waters. I drink lots of Lake Michigan water right out of the tap every day. <laughs> and I hope it's not polluted. And that Great Lakes water is uh, pretty well protected. I think we're starting to put people in jail and putting companies out of business that are polluters. And, uh, you know, there, but there's some nasty rivers out there and nasty lakes that have been neglected. So um, that's a good topic for you to work on is pollution, air, plastic, oil, air and water pollution. Um, but I would make sure you got your story straight and everything. You know, one thing I was thinking about with the Green Party and third parties is that they do, um, they do get their issues out there. So um, if you have a really strong argument and say for plastics and water or pollution or something like that and you bring it to the forefront and make an issue and the people start noticing then the you know the big fat cat politicians the republican and the democrat are going to have to do something about it so maybe it is a good thing for third parties to uh bring up their issues as long as it's a strong argument so good luck we're up in uh quigley's District or Shakowski or who else? Who's your congressman? Quigley, Schneider, Andy. Who? 
You don't have one? Raj? Raja. Raja. So hopefully they'll be your Schneider. So hopefully you'll they'll be your colleagues soon in November or whenever. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, no. I go Can I go All right. Four minutes. So I'm going to go a little different. So one small flower pot can give you your house, fresh air, and something alive. The south window is best, but winter rye will grow. Will grow real good. Do not overwater the soil. If it's moist, leave it alone. Add compost. Add compost of big shells and bits of apple and small pieces of apple on the soil. And the bacteria and fungi will eat that up in one minute. I do it that way in the sun and the soil is doing great. So if I was outside in the farm, I could do it the same way and it would make it rain. And then there'd be a lot of water. So the South Chicago farm on the southeast side of Chicago has goats. And goats have manure, which is pellets. And those pellets can be very good fertilizer for the soil. And the bacteria and fungi will eat that stuff up in a minute. I plan on getting a four by eight raised bed garden in the very soon. And it should be opening up next week for the summer. And I think I'll have a lot of water in there every day because water is real important. And growing mint and tomatoes is very popular. So compost in the garden is terribly important. Add fruit scraps like apple peels, banana peel, and rotten food into the soil, and the soil will like it. Soil is 25% air, 25% water, and 5% organic matter, 30% sand. 30% silt and 30% clay. That's loam. So the more organic material it makes it more nutritious. I've eaten things that taste terrible or have no taste. That means it needs some compost. And it'll attract water, you know, hold the water in the soil. And then everybody will be happy. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, and I'm going to let you go next, and then we'll go to Charlie. Anna, go ahead. Charlie uh, had his hand up before I did, though. OK, then Charlie. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that if everybody in that room ran Green Party, it would really change a whole lot of things. And I know people might think Green Party, but it's really a great way for us to, it's, we like to encourage communities and we also like individual rights. So we have a big spread of like freedom of religion, freedom of individual rights. So it's just a great place to grow. And um, I'm just saying, if everybody in that room decided to run, 2024 would be a lot different. Is that it, Anna? Very good. Okay. All right, Charlie, you're next. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Madam Candidate 
for an excellent presentation, PowerPoint, and you handled the questions, I must say, better than most of the candidates we've had here at the college over the years. Very detailed, and you didn't avoid anything, the tough ones. Uh, let's see, I've got three things to talk about. One, Illinois is, in by nature, in a drought situation. That's why it is a prairie state. And trees are not growing here. Now, that's what I mean. It's a natural condition. I've given talks on the status of what is the prairie. And that's why it is grasslands. It's mid, mid tall grass. And we are in a state of drought by virtue. Uh, if they're wet years, those are unusual. Now, there's two things I'd like to talk about regarding this. Number one, uh, there's two things we can do and in this district. One is uh, wherever possible, and I included this in my own version of Green New Deal, is to create marshlands or swamps. There is absolutely nothing better for a natural filtration of water than a marsh or a swamp. And wherever possible, these should be created because that is a natural way of cleansing water. A marshland or a swamp uh, should be created wherever possible uh, to augment the, the supply of pure water. Now, the other thing we can do on an individual basis is water conservation and reclamation. People should put up rain barrels, use water. Let's say that guy has a garden. If he reclaimed the water, rainwater, and use that for his six by eight plot, it would lessen the amount of water that would be drained upon the system at large. So two aspects we should do is create natural habitat that fosters the production of clean water and two uh, uh, individual things. The Water Reclamation District has information on, on doing a, a rain barrel system, uh, which is very easy to do and collect water from your garage or home uh, and use it in applications. And the third thing I'd like to talk about is if you like this candidate, please do two things. One, join the Green Party, as I did many, many years ago, several decades ago. And two, volunteer for the campaign. If you want information on getting in touch with her and contact with the campaign, we need people to collect signatures. Please get in touch with me or contact her directly. I believe she's on social media but I can refer you to the campaign and maybe some of you can get down there uh, for a Saturday and collect signatures. It is quite a burden to get on the ballot in Illinois, as has been mentioned. And I'm quite certain that this young lady could use our help. Thank you for coming to the college and please come back at any time with an update on what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next. So I just want to comment on a couple of things that were said, um, not by Chibu. Uh, first, Chibu, thank you for running. Uh, I agree with your views on Gaza. And I just wanted to talk about what Tim said, or you know, what one of our other guests um, said about the, the Hamas charter calling for the destruction of Israel. I looked up that document, a 1988 Hamas charter. If you look for the word destroy or Israel and Zionism, they're not in there. I don't even, I'm not even, uh, the word Jews is in there. So what it says is it quotes part of the Quran, which says um, that the end times will come when Muslims fight Jews and the bushes will cry out, there is a Jew behind me, kill it. Now that may sound anti-Semitic, but if you think about it, it's not calling for direct, it's not directly calling for the killing of Jews. There's nothing in the language of the Hamas charter that calls for the destruction. There's just kind of, what sounds like a biblical prophecy 
And if you think about it, it's almost as if it's saying that the environment itself will turn against, you know, not necessarily you, but the, the militaristic state of Israel, if you think about it that way, um, with America being Israel's partner, um, uh, uh, an ally, um, Israel's wars against uh, the Muslim world that America is contributing to is uh, causing a lot of pollution. Military is number one, number one polluter in the world. So the environment participating. Think about it that way. Doesn't call for the direct destruction of Jews. Furthermore, the Jewish opposition and the possible So another issue about this taking um, using people with human shields. First of all, if you're on the battlefield and you can't tell the difference between a shield and a child. If something's wrong with your vision, you shouldn't be on the battlefield. Second, you have to think about this from a Palestinian. But I thought, <laughs> uh, but I liked what he was saying. So let the recording show, I concur. We should be restored shortly. Hi, Charles, since we're both still here. And How it's recording. Many How many signatures do you need during what time period? I have 12,710 is the minimum. And my goal is to get to realistically 15,000, but 20,000 would be the ultimate goal, particularly once the school season end and all of my like educating people are going to be free. <laughs> um. But yep, I need at least 12,710 verified register voters in the district and only in the district. And what, I'm between what dates, what time yep, frame? Um between uh between now and June 24th, June 15th is my um is the goal to make sure I have at least like, you know, 15,000 and the rest will just be a surplus. I do. I I have a good team and we're getting signatures in Illinois, uh, in like Champaign-Urbana and in Springfield. Uh, and I'm going to be going to East St. Louis on April uh, 25th, 26th, which is that Friday, the last Friday of April. Um, but yeah, 12,710. Well, I hope you can hope you can do it. Ooh. Okay, we're back. Yeah. So sorry about that, Charlie. We wound up losing connection again. 
So, uh, I did, in case I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Joe Coptic from the Lake County Green Party. I just wanted to wrap up by saying Charlie mentioned the possibility of dealing with the Great Lakes as kind of one political entity. I just want to let people know the term for that is bioregionalism. And if you look up the Cascadia Independence Movement in Oregon, Washington State, and British Columbia, that is an effort to have a new country based on the Cascadia River watershed. And you could do that with different watersheds in America. Now, not that this is not that this is a point against bioregionalism. There's not a good. There's a there's plenty of good reasons to support bioregionalism. Um, one is tracking where water pollution comes from by tracking the upstream. You wouldn't have to go into different political uh, different jurisdictions. Um, you have a things in one watershed. But the difficulty with this is since you have things like the the Illinois Sanitation Canal, which it's water from Lake Michigan go down <laughs> towards St. Louis and the Mississippi. What you have is you have water from Duluth going to New Orleans. You have water from Duluth going to Montreal and the St. Lawrence River. And you have a thing up in, in like Wyoming or something called uh, Two Oceans Pass and Two Oceans Creek. It's a river that drains into both the Pacific, like the Snake and Columbia River system to the west, and into the Missouri and Mississippi. So um, figuring out a border based on that is probably doable, but it, it would be complicated. Like, so I, I hopefully I might do a talk about bioregionalism sometime in the future and explain my take on it why I support it. But that's what it involves. Like, it's called bioregionalism. Okay, I'm going to do my rebuttal next. Go ahead, go ahead. Keep go. Go. We got another one coming up, Chai. Tra it's Chai Boo, right? It's Chi Boo. Chibu. Thank you, Chibu. Sorry about that. Thank you. Want me to pronounce it for you? No, go ahead. All right, you're online. You got four minutes. I don't want four minutes. I, I just wanted to say that uh, it, the subject was brought up today as uh, Harvey Wasserman's article called uh, uh, Sam Randoso is Dead. And Sam Randoso. Uh, you really, really should find out about him. There was a huge, and it's been going on, the, the scandal around um, a bill in the Ohio State Legislature called HB6. And HB6, you know, I honestly at one time knew what HB6 was about, but the, the, the um, the Democrats tried to uh, get HB6 on the ballot as a referendum to repeal HB6. And uh, people like Sam Randolfo and uh, um, Larry Householder, and Larry's in jail, by the way. Um, and there's several other people in jail, to say nothing of the people who are in jail from Illinois utilities. And what's your name and some others, uh, everybody, everybody around Mike Madigan, but Mike Madigan himself. But um, anyway, Sam apparently fell a few stories and um, ended up, he was, he was under so much legal pressure that it was, it probably just got to him that he had been so disgraced. It is a story very, very much listening to and reading about because it is a cautionary tale about um, the money and the power, the political power that's going into the nuclear project. Okay. It's Rando Randozo, R A N A. Oh, geez, you're fine. I guess I can't spell it. Well, Mike, I think you've got it because uh, if there's one thing that the green movement and a lot of these environmentalists don't like, is that they would uh, like to deindustrialize us, get us back to going to the farms like Charlie does, like the uh, peasant farms. Well, I'm sorry, guys, I like my modern world. 
I like getting on a plane and I like being to Europe in less than 12 hours. I like driving a car. And I like and I, I like my modern way of life where I can have a little convenience. And the reason we had that convenience and this stuff is because of the corporation. And yes, it's been because of fossil fuels and oil and plastics and everything else. The thing is, so is that if you really want to get off oil and you want to have an advanced industrial society, nuclear power is going to have to be part of it. Run airplanes for cars. It can it can be with the synthesized environmentally clean fuel. Synthesized and burned up. But anyway, what I'm simply saying is this the current generation of reactors has a lot of problems to it. The current generation does have a lot of environmental things that go wrong. As a matter of fact, Alvin Weinberg, who was one of the inventors of the light water reactor, also said that they did have problems. And in fact, he was fired in 1973 by Congressman Chet Holyfield because he was explaining the uh, danger of the current nuclear power fleet. However, that doesn't mean that we have to toss the baby out with the bathwater. There are safer forms of reactors out there that terminally called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor that I've been doing research on and been familiar with for the last 15 years. It was an achieved commercial use yet, but they ran it for well over 2,400 hours. And it's a whole different ball game than the current form of well, reactors we have now. There is one currently running in China that within three years will have commercial commercial use. And it's going to probably that we're going to be able to have enough power to run an advanced society. I'm not against renewables. I'm not against uh, other forms of power. I'm not against, uh, you know, conservation or any of these other building stuff. But if you're a truly a green environmentalist and you're against nuclear power, I think you're crazy because if you look, there's a report out. You're by, uh, crazy. Uh, you're crazy. I don't know what the hell you're talking about with nuclear power. You're one of those who's stuck in the 1970s and doesn't know. Now, I'm aware that Fukushima happened. I'm aware that a lot of this other stuff happened. And some, that's why we need to shut a lot of these large-scale reactors down over time. It's going to cost us a lot of money. But when you get small modular liquid fluoride-type reactors, you're not going to have it. And the thing is, Germany right now tried to shut down all their new nuclear power went to all renewables and their energy costs almost tripled. And what they're doing is they're relying a lot on France, which has well over 80% of their power in nuclear and they're not generating that much waste on it. And yes, I do, I'm aware that waste is a problem, but very on the ground for years. A lot of it can be recycled too as well. But anyway, the other thing I'm gonna talk about is that you know, a lot of you guys trash modern corporations and trash the uh, billionaires and trash everybody else. When re in reality, it's been the building block of our modern society. The aggregation of capital for investment or an idea has been around for a long time. It's what built the railroads. Yes, I know we had the credit mobilier problem in the 1800s. Yes, I know we've had corporate uh, troubles in the land, like Enron and some of the other things. But that's what happens when we uh, don't have the proper regulation in place on a lot of these corporations. Now, there is a place for regulation, but there's also a place for free markets. And there's also a place for it all. The point of the matter is, I don't think you can change the human propensity for good or evil. We all have it. And I think it was biblically called sin years ago. I think what's happening today in a lot of our societies, we've just forgotten who we are and the morality of what's going on. You know, like I said, abortion wouldn't be a problem if you didn't have before marriage. You wouldn't have a lot of the troubles. 
I'm not saying it's uh, everybody's going to like it, but there is a place for morality in our society. And I think a lot of that really has to do. It's not the government. It's not uh, the system. A lot of times it's just us making the wrong choices. Us being responsible for our actions. Personally, I'd like to think I'm trying my best to do so. I am a committed Christian. I do go to church on Sunday, and I do try to do my best to live by that by that aspect. Now, I know I'm trying to preach to the choir here a little bit more, but uh, again, I'm just going to simply say, you know, there are solutions to our problems. And a lot of it just might have to be with our own selves and just trying to keep our our um, stuff, our environment, you know, even uh, Milton Friedman, in his book, you know, all about capitalism, I'm up. about the cost I'm of up. All right, Charlie, time's up. I guess you're going to tell me that it's going on. No way here. I know there's Let's go here, to the speaker's you know, comments. comments. I know, Charlie, you don't like what I'm having to hear. And, uh, I know I'm giving you a lot of slack too or rebuttals, but let's go back. All right, let's get our anybody else up here real quick. Come on, that's it. Let's go. We had plenty. Let's take our speaker. Up there, and then we'll have Chibu um, get the last word. Okay. Tim was right on the nuclear. Well, mostly right. Okay, we got Andy going too. It's seven oh eight, Charlie. We still got time. Go ahead. Because there is a debate about small nuclear, and the large nuclear actually could be a little more efficient uh, economies of scale. The thousand megawatt size can be just as efficient, if not more. Some of your small nuclear reactors can produce a little more waste because they lose you lose the economies of scale. Okay. Is that it? All right, yeah. Andy, go ahead. <laughs> all right, Andy, go ahead. You need all of the above. I know all that. All the speaker above. was Chibu. Chibu. Chibu, thank you very much for a, a coherent presentation tonight. Um, air and water are two of the things that humans need to survive. Uh, they have not figured yet how to put a meter on the air. They haven't figured out how to put a meter on the sun yet, but they're metering water all over the world and shutting people's water off that they can't pay. It's one of the big crimes against humanity. They, they, hello, you guys. Hey, back there. Mike, could you guys move over there so I can concentrate for just a couple minutes? Thanks. Uh, we have, I think, running on the Green Party ticket is an excellent idea to uh, get coverage of these ideas, major issues that the media don't cover. Uh, you know, water quality is. One of the things that uh, is affecting water quality in the United States is fracking. And it, uh, you, you didn't mention it, but the Bush administration bought 19, uh, you know, the Bush family bought 19,000, 98,000 acres of land in a corner of Paraguay. That sits over the world's last largest pressed aquifer. These billionaire predators are planning to go into water business as they get out of the oil business. As oil is increasingly shown to be obsolete for energy compared to cheap solar and wind power backed up with batteries. We're in the transition years right now, between now and 2030. And we all have to do our part to speak up when we see something is wrong. I I made a, a found the world is silence means consent. 
if you're silent about something, it means that you agree to it, that it's okay. Um, we have to begin to speak up now about what's happening around the world. Tim and I are going to give a speech in a few weeks about the Republican plan that is the criminals masquerading as Republicans to take over the election and just install 50,000 Trump toadies to run the government spent for clean air, clean water, clean food. It'll be an all out war on, on the environment and war on the people for short term 90 day billionaire profits. That's what's coming in November if we don't keep Trump and his criminals from getting elected. So, there's a website uh, called Want to Know Info, Want to Know dot info that talks about these things. They have huge archives of credible material that's not political. Their, their motto is beyond beyond partisanship, beyond censorship, and beyond politics. Just learning what happened, what, what's going on in the world, what the problems are, and what the solutions are. Want to know? Got info. It's the single most hopeful site I know of, other than Rocky Mountain Institute, that talks about beneficial energy programs going on all over the world. Thank you very much, and thanks again for a good presentation. Okay, uh, since there's no more. All rebuttals. Uh, take as much time as you need. You can give and take up to 15 minutes or so. Just uh, unmute and uh, the floor is all yours. All right. Thank remarks. You. Yeah. We'll after so this. <laughs> and yeah. So here are my final remarks. One, uh, I think that I a lot of people were like, you agree, thank you. And so, huh, yes, I have thought through a lot of this. I've been thinking about this for a majority of my life. What I want is to be useful to my constituents, useful to my community, and the most authentic person I who I am and be useful in that way. And so this is why I'm going through the Green Party. This is why I have thought through and why I'm co so cohesive and and, con and concise is because I want you all to ask me questions, which means that you're thinking how I'm thinking or you're considering my logic. And my logic is pretty found and it's based on what older folks, what older generations have also argued for and have also wanted. So I appreciate that I'm taking what you all have done in the past and hopefully bringing in that new energy to, to really fulfill those goals. We are in the transition period between fossil fuels and whatever comes after fossil fuels. <laughs> um, hopefully it's renewable energy. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, but whatever ends up being, it is our job and it is my generation that's gonna be the next step into getting us there. And so there will be trade-offs and the way we get, the way we care for the trade-offs in a way that makes it so that the working class, the, which is the majority of Illinois, actually would be considered themselves middle-class working class. Um, and I say we all are working class because we all work for a rage. Um, and if you're like, if your income is based on a living, like wage working, then you're, you're working class. Um, but again, this is Illinois. So people like to be middle-class. The question of how do we keep our modern luxuries? This is something that's come up with other, um, I would say more like Republican people, at least in this circumstance, but older folks who um, who want to quote, maintain their luxuries. It was brought up the railroads. I like flying. I travel as often as possible. That's what I use my money for. Like my disposable income, I use on travel and on food <laughs> uh, okay. and, you know, and like movies. So that's, those are things that I'm interested in. I want to continue to be able to go to the movies as I understand it. And I want to be able to continue to have the cell phone that I have, which is a modern technology, which is 
partially included in the, the issue that's happening in Sudan. They're all connected. So how is it that we can, that the United States and Illinois can keep our quote luxuries that we have and still reconcile the fact of how, like the process in which we get these things and the, the toll that it took to get them as well. Yeah. Using the railroad as an example, you know, I, I take the Amtrak all the time, well, as often as I can, because it's nicer than, <laughs> than the Greyhound at the current moment, but the, the uh, Amtrak is accessible. So I use it. It's a railroad. It's also like a private public uh, partnership because they all have to share the limited railroads that we have that are up to standard. And yet the railroads weren't just built out of nowhere and given with the love of the government, it was taken from indigenous land. So it's built on the, on the mass murders of indigenous folks from the, um, from this, from uh, there's the people of this land of the United States Two, it was built with a lot of in debt, like enslaved labor. So African um, American descendants of slaves. So it came from their labor and is also key. It was also built with the expressed discrimination and abuse of like Chinese immigrants in this country. Uh, and so because this Chinese Exclusion Act came through with the railroads. So those are three groups of people, particularly that were directly impacted by the luxury that we now have, which is modern railroad system of the United States. That cannot be taken away and that cannot be um, overlooked that there is death and destruction that came with our luxuries. There is death and destruction that's come with the luxuries that I wanna keep too. The truth is there has to be a change. There's going to be a give and take and some things are gonna be left from the old world into the new one that we have. That's just a practical reality. What I would like as your future Congresswoman and overall is to make it sure that the trade-offs that we end up having to make as a community, as a society are always gonna be to the benefit of the working class, which is all of us. It's gonna be to the benefit of the middle class, which is all of us. Um, power, like I want to be able to fly to France. Agreed. Cool. So since I want to be able to do that, and French commoners want to do that too, um, it, uh, that means that we're gonna have to take pollution from other places. The military is the the United States military is the biggest polluter in like the entire world, or at least the United States. So. <laughs> These are key things that we have to realize. We have to prior we have to prioritize the middle working class and our wants and our needs and what actually we what we actually use and deprioritize things that no one cares about. Did you realize so those are the key things? And so thinking about the the, the railroad and flying, how are we subsidizing these things currently? How are we paying for these things out of pocket currently? If we pause and look, we'll see that lower income, like everyday Americans are the people who are paying the most for these luxuries for other people. We don't need to do that. The The, the burden is always on us. It's always on us. We have to, we have to shift the burden. We have to shift the, per, the perspective of what's important to us. Cause otherwise at some point, you're right. They haven't figured out a way to charge for air yet. They haven't figured out a way to charge for the sun yet. But I promise you they would if they could. And who who is we? I would never do that as a person. You know, like that innate that innate in good and evil, all that sin stuff. I wouldn't do that. But but we currently have laws that prioritize that kind of um that kind of like movement that that prioritize that kind of work that prioritize that kind of sin, if you wanna go into like religious terms or critically Judeo-Christian terms, cause the sin thing, that like we should not be rewarding sinful behavior. We need to be rewarding behavior that behooves the larger community and behooves the, 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 the smallest of us all because ultimately I am always closer to being destitute in whatever sense that looks like than being a trillionaire. And that will never not happen.
And so, yeah, I would say that if you want clean water, not only for yourself, if you feel like you have it, and also for others, if you want to be whole in your wellness and, um, and, and get rid of medical debt and getting dental for everyone across the zip codes covered where you're not paying out of pocket to the point where you can now are accruing medical debt. If you want to be able to, um, to relieve the working and middle class and our parents through student loan forgiveness and no longer taking on a uh, student loan, like interest, just not, not, not having it anymore, wiping and abolishing these things. We can have a society that in 50 years, we're all benefited from and we're all for the better. This transition period is, it feels like one in a million because it's our current world that we understand, but it's just one aspect. It's one part of a longer, of a longer like journey. And, and we need to pivot. Otherwise we are currently seeing like, uh, I really hope it's over exaggeration, but like we're currently seeing potential steps to what could be seen as a world war and, or that's a, that's a fear. That's a fear that I'm starting to see amongst my friends of like, oh, here's all these things happening in a different part of the world. That's going to end up impacting us. We have to pivot so that way we're not in war, we're not in waste, and we're not abusing the, the, the ground and the people who till it. We got to change. Illinois is a whole bunch of farmers and I'm one of them, we moving and changing the way we do now through the Green Party is one way that I can be useful to the community. So yes, if you want clean water for others and for yourself across the nation, if you want to be able to make an impact, not only vote for me, but sign for me and petition for me too. Um, the reason why there's a spoiler is because it's been manufactured by the two parties. There doesn't have to be there isn't one really, and um, and the world can change. And this is me being a part of that transition. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. All right, Andy, you got one final. No, let's go. Let's go. Thanks. We're done. We're done. We're done. Let's go. Charlie, we'll uh, we'll take now, Tim. We are Thank done. You. All right. Tim, we are done. All right. No, Andy. Andy, Andy, Andy Tim. We're, we're, Come back please. again. Come back again. Come back next week. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later, okay? Sorry about that. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I had I enjoyed my time. I'll definitely um figure out another topic.